I certainly think we could all say that uh, Peter Hasrick is a tough act to follow. But we've got a great act to follow. Our next speaker, Eric Paddock, is the curator of the photography department at the Denver Museum of Art. Uh, before uh, assuming uh, this position um, in 2008, uh, he served as a curator of photography for the Colorado Historical Society, where he accomplished wonders uh, over a 26-year career. Uh, he increased the uh, photo holdings of the society by 500,000 images, half a million images. Is that true? And and uh, 32,000 films uh, were added to, with uh, Colorado uh, subjects, were added to uh, the collection. Um, along the way, he found time to organize exhibitions for uh, a number of photographers, uh, Barbara, Bar Barbara Bosworth, Gary Winogrand, Laura Latinsky, and Chuck Foreman, among many others. Uh, Eric uh, also found time to uh, be a practicing photographer. I don't know if that's like an alcoholic, but uh, uh, he exhibited uh, his own work. Um, he is the author of uh, the book Belonging to the West. Uh, his works, his own photographs are in the uh, collect museum collections of such institutions as the Museum of Modern Art uh, in both New York and San Francisco, the Smithsonian American Art Museum, uh, the Bibliothèque Nationale in uh, France. Uh, he's been a visiting uh, professor of uh, photography at the University of Denver, uh, Colorado College. Uh, I might have uh, said earlier that uh, he received his uh, BA at Colorado College and his MFA from Yale University in photography. On uh, May 18th of this year, he received the Hal Gould uh, Vision in Photography Award, which was uh, given uh, to um, uh, someone in uh, the Western region uh, who has made a significant contribution uh, to raising awareness of the value and appreciation of uh, photography uh, and, uh, and the photography arts. Uh, his special expertise lies in American landscape photography uh, from 1850 to the present, especially expedition photographers in the West uh, between 1867 and 1890. Uh, he also uh, uh, has a, a special interest in uh, the 20th century uh, work of the new topographic movement, a uh, uh, group of photographers active from 1960 to 1982. Um, he is interested in the way that uh, photography or photographers express themselves uh, in their work and the way in which their uh, photographs reflect social, uh, cultural, uh, and economic values. Uh, today, his subject is a, a familiar photographer uh, uh, as far as the Yellowstone National Park is concerned. His name is uh, William Henry Jackson. Uh, photographed the Yellowstone country with Hayden Survey in 1872 uh, and uh, photographed off and on in Wyoming from uh, 1868 until his uh, death in 1942. Please welcome Eric Paddock. Uh, he'll be speaking on Yellowstone and the making of William Henry Jackson. Eric. Thank you, Byron, and thank you, Karen, and thank you to everyone for coming here and to the uh, Buffalo Bill Center for inviting me. Um, I had to chuckle when you mentioned how much I contributed to the overpopulation of the photo collection at the Colorado Historical Society. Um, it was actually closer to 600,000 photos, but uh, my successor over there, uh, Megan Friedel, is a great scholar and a terrific curator and we get together for lunch four or five times a year 
she always brings a notebook with her, a three-ring binder, and on the spine of the binder it says, what the hell were you thinking? <laughs> and she just writes down questions, and we go over that, and I try to explain myself, and that's the way it goes. Um, so where's the switch? Okay. Um, as the first slide indicates, I'm here to talk about William Henry Jackson and Yellowstone, but I think there often are a lot of, not misperceptions, but myths that surround Jackson's activity in Yellowstone and Yellowstone National Park. Uh, I'm not here to punch holes in those myths, but rather to talk about this kind of from a different angle and to talk about how coming to Yellowstone and working here shaped Jackson's work, his reputation, and his career uh, at a, a really critical juncture in his life. So we'll start with these. Um, and I'll come back to these a little bit later if there's time. Uh, but these are postage stamps that were issued in 1935 as part of a, a series issued by the Postal Service uh, commemorating and celebrating America's national parks. Oh, I see. I can't leave my notes on top of the computer. Uh, this photograph was based, or these stamps were based on a photograph that William Henry Jackson had made here in Yellowstone in 1882. And uh, he came back uh, at the ripe old age at that point of 92 to uh, uh, mark that celebration and sent uh, uncut, unperforated blocks of stamps to uh, friends far and wide as gifts in recognition of their uh, their love and their support. Uh, the photograph or the stamps are based on this photograph. We'll come back to this a little bit later in the talk, but let's get down to it. This is our golden boy in 1866 at the ripe old age of 24. Photograph, it's a portrait that was made in the Frank Mowry studio in Rutland, Vermont, where Jackson had learned photography as a teenager before enlisting in the Union Army and going off to, the, uh, to Virginia during the Civil War. After the war, he returned to Rutland and took up his job, which apparently wasn't terribly interesting or challenging to him at the time. But the thing that was challenging was a woman named Caddy Eastman, who he courted uh, assiduously for a couple of years. But in 1868, they got in a little argument. Apparently, uh, they went for a carriage ride on a nearby road, and uh, one of his friends, one of Jackson's friends, pulled up next to him, challenged him to a race. And so you had these two carriages going hell for leather down the road and uh, nearly tipping over and spilling the uh, feminine contents of the wagons into a ditch. And uh, Caddy took umbrage at that. They had sharp words, harsh words. And in Jackson's telling of the story, uh, he packed up and left the next day. Um, interestingly, about 10, 12 years ago, a, a daguerreotype portrait of Caddy Eastman turned up in the William Henry Jackson portion of Fred Rosenstock's papers at Brigham Young University Library. Uh, the portrait had been misfiled for about 50 years, but uh, had arrived at the library among many of Jackson's personal effects that were collected after his death. And apparently, he carried that photograph with him uh, for his entire life. Um, that's kind of a parenthetical piece of the story, though. Uh, Jackson left the next day, uh, went to New York City, where he fell in and uh, drank a lot with some uh, Civil War buddies of his. And they all ended up traveling west first to Cincinnati, then St. Louis, then St. Joseph, Missouri, where he washed up with no money and uh, took a job as a bullwhacker on the Bozeman Trail and uh, started up the trail towards uh, the, the diggings up around Bozeman and Virginia City, but kind of uh, weaseled out or flaked out partway and ended up uh, detouring to Ogden and then Salt Lake City where he met with the photographer Andrew Joseph Russell. Russell at this time was engaged in photographing and documenting the construction of the Transcontinental Railway. That uh, uh, illustration that Peter showed was based on a Russell photograph of uh, the uh, 
railroad construction in Green River, U Green River, Utah, in um, what 1868. So uh, Jackson spent some time with Russell. He spent the winter in Salt Lake City tutoring a group of children and teaching them, among other things, to draw, which puzzles me because Jackson was a horrible draftsman. Um, but, you know, I don't know, maybe it launched a whole new tradition of uh, third-rate illustration in, uh, in uh, Deseret. Uh, he ended up for, uh, forging ahead, went out to Los Angeles, worked there for a while, uh, briefly opened a photography studio, decided it wasn't for him, and uh, went back east as far as Omaha. In 1868, he opened a photographic studio with his brother in Omaha, Nebraska, and they specialized in views of the city and its environs, such as this wonderful rooftop view of Farnham Street. And uh, of course, this is a stereographic photo, and the whole strategy is to make a photograph when seen in three dimensions, kind of dramatizes the, uh, the three-dimensional space of the scene in front of the picture. So Jackson is looking not only at those buildings in the distance, but particularly at the muddy road and the ruts in the road in the foreground, which lead the eye into the distance and, and kind of give you some entree into the photograph. Jackson at this time was very interested in photographing American Indians, and he would make occasional trips out into the hinterlands of Nebraska and leave the studio in, in his brother's hands and later confessed that he wasn't much for staying at home and preferred to travel. Well, later that year, he followed the Union Pacific Railway, Railway line westward, uh, making pictures along the way in hopes of selling some of these images to some of the aggregators and, and uh, 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 packagers of stereo views of the West and of the world in general. Um, he ended up talking both to the uh, Anthony brothers in New York City and the photo manufacturer, uh, camera gear manufacturer, and uh, photographic entrepreneur Scoville in New York and ended up signing a contract with Scoville, or I'm sorry, with Anthony, to produce a series of uh, stereo views along the Transcontinental Railway. Of course, it hadn't been finished at that point. Um, but he went as far as he could and was making pictures like this one. It's a very complex picture, I think, of uh, the Dale Creek Bridge uh, down in uh, southern, well, where is that? I guess that is in southern Wyoming. It's right across the line outside of Colorado, uh, which was at the time one of the, one of the world's largest, largest wooden trestle bridges. And... Uh, quite a celebrated affair, and as Peter said, you know, the Transcontinental Railway was one of the great feats of engineering of the 19th century, and this bridge figured very prominently in that story and in the uh, reputation of the railroad at that time. I should mention that on that excursion, Jackson was accompanied by an assistant named Arundel Hull, who later claimed credit for many of the photographs that were published uh, over Jackson's name uh, in that stereographic series. And uh, it's kind of a footnote, really, because uh, Hull is essentially forgotten in the history of photography and recognized, if he's recognized at all, as the guy who carried a lot of Jackson's gear in 1868 and 69. Um, in 1869, Jackson repeated the trip, and it was kind of an interesting strategy. What he would do with Hall is they would buy a train ticket, and they would go into a town, and they would stop, knock on doors, ask people if they, had, if they needed photographs made, portraits, street scenes, pictures of shop fronts, so on and so forth. And they would spend a day or two going around making these pictures and processing the, uh, the prints and toning them in the hotel room at night. And then they would go around and deliver the prints and collect the money and use the proceeds to buy a ticket to the next town where they would repeat the process. And by doing that, they eventually uh, reached Salt Lake City and worked their way back. Now, these were these photographs were kind of 
functional. In a picture like this one of, I hope I'm on the right, I have to always check to make sure my notes and my slides are in the same place. Um, this picture of Corin, Utah, is just a, a wonderful sort of frontier street scene where he's looking at the buildings and showing kind of the boom that was uh, set in motion by the arrival of the railroad. And that's a photograph that speaks to not only the prosperity and the history of the place, but also to its future. But it's really kind of a flat-footed, rather plain-spoken image. And um, I guess one of the most noteworthy things about this to me is the space in that picture. He's using a very short lens of what we would now call a wide-angle lens that encompasses a pretty wide view and that tends, in this case, to emphasize the foreground. Many photographers would overcome that by uh, perching their camera on top of a ladder or climbing onto a rooftop so that the sweep of the foreground would lead you into the more interesting parts of the picture. But here, all that muddy road, muddy street, kind of dominates the view. And this is one of the things that Jackson is contending with and learning about as he's making these pictures. He would also occasionally kind of stumble into something or, in the case of a photograph like this one, uh, put his tripod, the legs of his tripod, virtually in the holes of the uh, tripod legs that where Andrew Joseph Russell had made a photograph a year earlier and would replicate the view with varying uh, degrees of success. But in this case, I think he, he got there at just the right moment. You know, that beautiful shadow of Teapot Rock and the little tiny figure standing to the left of it, right there, uh, really speaks to some of the grandeur and the e extraordinary spaces as well as the geological oddities uh, that Jackson was encountering and that others were encountering in their travels through the American West. Well. I have here a map of, of the United States uh, in 1870. And this is a population map. So the, uh, the, the grays indicate the density of population and settlement across what we now consider the lower, lower 48 states. That kind of uh, buckskin or orangish color uh, indicates uh, Indian reservations. So you can see that the population is really kind of massed in the eastern United States, moving its way westward. And there are small pockets of settlement in California, on Colorado's Front Range, in Utah, and so forth. And even in the Rio Grande Basin, although uh, a lot of that population is, is uh, Mexican-American population that had been occupying that territory since the 16th century. Well, this is here because in the 1860s, in the wake of the Civil War, the federal government uh, funded a number of expeditions into the American West. And these are generally referred to as the great surveys of the American West. They were led by uh, a notable figures such as John Wesley Powell, Major John Wesley Powell, who uh, basically floated down the Green and Colorado Rivers with one arm and uh, assessed or kind of inventoried the natural resources of, of the Colorado Plateau. Clarence King, whom I noticed was listed at the very bottom of that list of uh, charter members of the Boone and Crockett Club in the slide that Peter showed earlier, a uh, Yale-educated geologist who uh, led the King Survey along the 40th parallel from the Sierra Nevada crest eastward into uh, the Rocky Mountains in Colorado and southern Wyoming. Uh, Lieutenant George Montague Wheeler, who was with the Army Corps of Engineers and uh, directed an expedition or a series of surveys, expeditions into uh, the desert southwest in New Mexico and Arizona. And most interesting for our purposes here today, Ferdinand Vandeveer Hayden, the director of the so-called Hayden Survey or the Geologic and Geographic Survey of the territories. Now, when Jackson was uh, floating back and forth on the railroad in 1869, he met Hayden. Hayden was a scientist, a trained medical doctor and scientist who was uh, funded by the federal government to direct these expeditions 
into uh, Wyoming territory at the time. Jackson encountered him at a brothel in Laramie and described him as looking like a cat in a strange garret. Um, but they apparently exchanged a few friendly words and uh, went on about whatever they were up to. Uh, Jackson returned to Omaha, printed a lot of the photographs that he had made, and uh, later in the year, Hayden uh, dropped by the studio in Omaha, looked at the photographs, and said, hey, um, you know, I'm running this series of survey expeditions in Wyoming territory, and we could really use a photographer. And it'd be great if you could come with us. I can't actually pay you anything. All I can promise you is uh, hard work and, and okay food uh, for the season, but I'd really love it if you'd join us. So uh, Jackson did. And uh, in 1870, he ventured into uh, Wyoming territory. Now, I have to sort of clarify one thing. You know, these expeditions uh, looked very heroic and adventuresome in the press back east. Leslie's Weekly Journal, Harper's Weekly, and uh, the New York Philadelphia and Philadelphia newspapers really pumped up the hyperbole and uh, made these things look like, uh, I don't know, something comparable to Columbus's discovery of, uh, the, of the Western Hemisphere land masses or, um, or the, uh, the journey of Lewis and Clark. But as the map indicates, you know, the West was already seeing some population growth uh, there were mineral strikes in uh, California, Colorado, Montana. Um, populations were moving westward along the Overland Trail, the Old Mormon Trail, the Oregon Trail. And this was an area that was really poised for development. And as Peter indicated, the extirpation of the bison and uh, to a large extent the American Indian. Uh, the surveys nominally were intended to kind of catalog the natural resources and in, uh, assess the natural resources of this area to uh, kind of figure out the suitability of various regions, not only for settlement, but for extractive industries. Um, there's also, I think, a, a fairly clear argument that in the wake of the Civil War, this was a, a, an attempt by the federal government to consolidate federal control over Western territories and to prevent a resurgence of the Confederacy in, in a new part of the world. But uh, most of that rested on some very detailed mapping of a country west of the 100th meridian. And accompanying the expedition, there were also botanists, agronomists, paleontologists, uh, scientists of every stripe who were um, you know, grateful for the opportunity to go out into the field and do research in areas that uh, were substantially unknown to science at that time. The, fo the focus of the survey then was quite far flung, and the purpose of the photographer was to assist uh, the other survey party members by photographing, say, from one survey benchmark to the next, uh, and also to photograph geologic uh, formations, botanical specimens, and so forth. And the secondary function at that time of the photographer was to make images that could be used to publicize the activities of the survey and also to um, uh, secure uh, ongoing funding from Congress because these surveys were funded from year to year, uh, not over the long term. So Jackson had several jobs to do that first summer, but interesting things happen. Here he is in camp uh, that first year. Jackson is over here on the left looking quite dashing with his hat and his shiny shirt and his tie. Hayden, looking much more sober and serious, sitting in the center of the table. But over here on the left, this tall, gaunt man is the, uh, uh, the painter Sanford Robinson Gifford, who was invited to accompany the expedition that year and uh, joined, the, joined the survey expedition rather late, left a little early. Uh, didn't seem terribly happy with the whole situation, but 
You know, this is an important turning point in Jackson's career because he's beginning to associate with other artists. One of the problems that all photographers faced when they came west is that you're, you're carrying a number of stylistic conventions with you, things that you've learned by looking at photographs from other parts of the country or illustrations and paintings of other parts of the world. And then suddenly you're confronted with these you know, sort of places where the, the, the forest cover is different, uh, the river drainages look very different, the space is much wider in most cases, uh, the climate is entirely different, and there are a number of sort of visual challenges that face every photographer as they try to resolve what it is they're looking at. So it's a great opportunity then for Jackson to kind of hang out with Sanford Gifford for the summer and talk about what Gifford's doing and talk about what he's doing and compare notes and actually compare artwork. And I'll get back to that uh, in a little while. But here's a Jackson photograph of Gifford painting in the Valley of the Chugwater. These are those uh, kind of uh, castellated bluffs just north of Chugwater, Wyoming, for those of you who drove up here from Denver uh, this week, and for those of you who just like to stomp around Wyoming and look at stuff. And um, of course, the town of Chugwater wasn't there. The reservoir wasn't there. I-25 uh, wasn't right down in here the way it is today. Uh, the expedition had taken the train as far as uh, Rock, uh, Green River, Wyoming, and then they had traveled overland and down the Sweetwater River um, into the North Platte Basin and then crossed over into the Chugwater drainage and then back up to the North Platte and home. And Gifford was making sketches and, and uh, drawings all along the way. And one of the results is his well-known painting, uh, The Valley of the Chugwater from 1870. Jackson, meanwhile, is trying to make photographs of other things in his own right. Here's a photograph again. This is Gifford leaning over his sketchbook or something uh, while an assistant looks on in, uh, at Devil's Gate on the Sweetwater in 1870. And this is kind of Jackson's introduction to a new way of thinking about pictures and a new way of thinking about uh, how he might make photographs. Of course, it's not all easy going. Uh, this is Jackson on the left with his, uh, oh, that's not Dolly, his white pack mule. It's, a, it's his uh, a horse that he was riding in 1871. And then a somewhat later photograph made in the Colorado Rockies in 1873 called The Photographer's Assistant. And I've always understood this to mean this is the four-legged assistant and the other guy is just somebody who stepped into the picture uh, at the last minute. But this shows you kind of what is going on. This is one uh, burrow that is carrying all the camera gear. This is the camera. That hole is where the lens would be inserted. Over here on the other side is a crate full of glass plates, and I'll talk about that a little bit later. Right there, that load is probably approximately 150 pounds. There would be two other burrows uh, trailing behind, pulling the chemicals and other material that Jackson required in order to make photographs in the field at this time. And then other animals who were carrying all the cooking gear and the tents and the bedrolls and everything, all that. So this is this is not, you know, like walking out, getting out of the car with your iPhone um, to make a picture. And in fact, in the time that uh, that it would take Jackson to make one photograph in the field, you could probably explode your iPhone by taking so many pictures that the memory would just lock up. All right. So 1871, uh, I miss, uh, they come back out, they take the train to Ogden, they travel overland to Fort Hall, Idaho, and start making their way up towards what is now known as Yellowstone. Um, again, as in that picture of Corin, Utah, Jackson is working with this very short focal length lens, lots of foreground, and he's 
trying to resolve that foreground with the rest of the image. So what it does is it tends to make things appear at somewhat farther distance than they actually are to the, when you look at them with the naked eye. But here he's really interested in the curve of this shoreline and those rocks that point across to the few trees that are, that are in the scene and is really working to kind of make sense of things through this sort of wide angle uh, consuming view of the landscape. Along the way, he's also documenting things such as this wonderful road. I just kind of threw this in here. It's crossing the Beaverhead River at Point of Rocks. And, you know, one of the reasons this is here is because it's a wonderful uh, document of the rock formation and of the, the river valley in the, in the foreground. But it also is something that reflects the established uh, infrastructure such as it is that existed in the American West when Jackson and these expeditions were working out here. They were on their way at this point up to the, uh, the diggings around Virginia City, Alder Gulch in uh, Montana, where Jackson was sort of obliged to make photographs such as this one of this placer operation where uh, a handful of workmen down here in the foreground are using water uh, to blast away the uh, side of this uh, hill and then uh, sift through the gravel or sort, process the gravel to uh, extract uh, metallic gold. But eventually they arrive uh, in uh, what we would now consider the greater Yellowstone region. And while they're here, camped at Boatler's Ranch, am I pronouncing that correctly? Bettler's, Boatler's, somebody's ranch. Uh, they encounter another group of people, including, I mean, this is, it was uh, a return visit of the Washburn Doan expedition and some of its members who came back in 1871 uh, to continue their explorations of the Yellowstone region. Uh, this was not a government funded survey, but rather a kind of private uh, promotional uh, event. Um, and included a photographer in its party. That photographer was a man named Joshua Chrisman, who had a studio in Bozeman, Montana. And uh, there is pretty strong documentary evidence that uh, Jackson and Chrisman photographed side by side for at least a month that summer. And at some point, Chrisman had to head home, went back to Bozeman, and for unexplained reasons, Jackson's assistant went with him. Um, Jackson complained in his diaries of having some technical difficulties with his materials that summer. And for about 20 years now, people have been trying to figure out whether some of the uh, photographs attributed to Jackson from that 1871 expedition aren't in fact photographs by Chrisman that uh, Jackson's assistant copied in Chrisman's studio back in, uh, back in Bozeman. It's one of those strange mysteries that kind of pervade the history of 19th century photography when photographers tended to treat the uh, Copyright Act of 1858 with, um, uh, well, loose uh, regard and uh, would freely copy one another's photographs and sometimes buy photographs from one another and then publish them under their own, uh, under their own name. And uh, it makes, it makes uh, the attribution of these photographs really fun and interesting. Um, but it also uh, raises you know, serious questions about the reliability of other accounts, such as uh, Jackson's uh, 1933 autobiography or 1938 autobiography, Time Exposure. This is a photograph that is known to be by Chrisman. At some point, word came into the camp that uh, some of the uh, camp hands had, had killed five elk uh, over in the Lamar Valley, and uh, Chrisman went hustling over there to uh, make photographs of that scene. This was later published uh, both as a cabinet view and as a stereograph uh, by um, uh, Chrisman in 1875, which leads us to the question, and I don't want—I'll be happy to respond to this during uh, the Q and A if there is any. Uh, 
Um, the question of whether Jackson was the first photographer in Yellowstone National Park. Uh, in his autobiography, he claims to have been, uh, but he does give credit to Chrisman as being a local photographer whose work was only known within a few miles of Bozeman. And the photographer Thomas Hine, who had ventured to Yellowstone from Chicago that summer, uh, got back to Chicago just in time to start printing his plates and lose everything in the Great Fire. So um, Jackson talks about that, but um, it's one of, the, one of the sustained things that we hear over and over again about Jackson. And the bottom line is maybe he was, maybe he wasn't. But in any case, he was the first photographer to have work widely published and distributed uh, representing views from Yellowstone. And here they are. One of the things that I love about these pictures from this year is that Jackson begins, he finally finds a place where he can put the camera and let the foreground of the image just fall into place really beautifully. And he does that over and over again in these photographs. This one, of course, becomes kind of a standard view. We saw a, a beer stat uh, made from approximately the same vantage point. Uh, I think later we might see a Moran, and um, and uh, photographs of of the hot spring in the foreground and Castle Geyser in the background tend to dominate imagery of of Yellowstone from the 1870s well into the uh, 20th century. Now, something that Jackson had to do, I mentioned those burrows and all the stuff that he had to carry back in the. 1870s, the standard way of making a photograph had nothing to do with uh, memory cards or even film. Uh, to make a photograph, you would start with a blank piece of glass. You'd set your camera up ahead of time. You'd compose the image, you'd frame it, you'd get everything set, and then you had to go into a tent if you were working in the field. Whoops. And there's the tent. There's Jackson, and in that tent, in subdued yellow colored light, you would coat that sheet of glass with collodion. Now, collodion is a, uh, a solution that's made by dissolving cellulose nitrate in a combination of ether and alcohol. Kills brain cells by the millions, but only the weak ones. And, um, and it's highly combustible. So you're in this confined space, pouring this goop onto a glass negative. It's about the consistency of corn syrup. And you had to tilt the negative this way and that until the collodion had spread from edge to edge and corner to corner and coated that glass. Then you would immerse the whole thing in a bath of silver nitrate, which is the light-sensitive compound that forms the photographic image. Um, that took a few minutes, but on a dry day in the Colorado or Wyoming or Montana Rockies, even more so in the, on the Colorado Plateau or in the uh, Rio Grande Basin, you might have about five minutes before the collodion dried. And once it was dried, you were up the creek. You couldn't, it was impermeable to chemicals and there was no way to develop the image. So you had to work very quickly and with great assurance and you'd run this thing out, put it in the camera, make the exposure, and then you had to go back into the tent to develop the negative. Okay, so which you did in pyrogallic acid. There's a great essay out there waiting to be written about the number of photographers who died or went crazy in the 19th century from fooling around with all these chemicals, uh, boiling mercury and stuff like that. Um, well, part of the point is that when you were finished, you had this negative and it was done. You could hold it up to the sky and look at it, check it for any kind of flaws or inconsistencies, but you could also judge its quality. You could determine whether it was in correct focus. You could determine whether you know, the leg of the tripod had slipped and the horizon was crooked. You could make a lot of qualitative decisions about whether to keep it or not. And if you didn't like it, you would just soak a rag in ether and wipe the image off that piece of glass and start over. 
So Jackson's process is is pretty interesting, but there's very little that he could do once he left that location to uh, improve upon or alter his photograph in any way. And that's quite distinct from the working methods of somebody like Thomas Moran, who joined the survey uh, that year and, and was making sketches in the field, which were preparatory works intended to, you know, as a form of note taking so that he could go back to his studio and make finished paintings. And if you compare these two views, there's some wonderful similarities in the structure of the two pictures. But you can see that this rock promontory here is this thing in this photograph. And they're working kind of elbow to elbow. And Jackson can look over Moran's shoulder at his sketches and they ask questions and talk about it. And Moran can look at Jackson's negatives and ask questions and talk about it. And presumably they would sometimes argue or remonstrate or um, uh, try to instruct one another as far as what they were doing. It's also this interesting kind of shift because Moran's sketches are necessarily rather generalized. If you look at this uh, wonderful, wonderful sketch, you see that there are whole areas that are blank. And there are notes that are written in to indicate uh, what might be done with this when it's uh, trans transmuted into a finished painting. But Jackson, of course, is swallowing things whole. So when he makes a photograph, that's it. And all the decisions have to be made. Everything has to be as perfect as he can make it at the moment of exposure. And this is where, you know, Peter made some wisecrack earlier about artists and then Oh yeah, those photographers. Um, and I'm not going to defend that, uh, the photographers too strenuously here, but the photographer has to make a lot of decisions in the field at the moment uh, uh, when he or she is setting up the camera and getting ready to make pictures. And those have to do with the exact placement of the camera relative to the subject, because that affects all the spatial and narrative relationships of everything in the picture. Uh, you raise the camera a little bit, you lower it, you move it two feet to the right or left, and everything changes a little bit. And part of the, what I would call the artistry in photography is, is managing that range of uh, possible decisions and, and having the guts to choose just one. It also, photography also relies very heavily on the edges of the frame because the verisimilitude of the photographic image suggests that you're really looking through a window at the world. And uh, you know, the window defines what you see. It can also, it can suggest things that are beyond the frame of the picture, but it can also kind of contain and create both uh, formal and narrative, uh, um, what structure or strength or vigor in the final photograph. One of the things that happens the year that the years that Jackson and Moran are working together is he goes back in 1872 with a much longer focal length lens, something more like what we would call a telephoto lens today. And what that does is it, it brings the distant thing, in this case the waterfall, closer to you, the viewer. It eliminates a lot of the foreground. It eliminates a lot of that stuff around the edges that create maybe a topographical context for the image, but uh, tends to make the, the actual subject of the picture a little bit weak. And these become kind of the classic views that are associated with Jackson's name when we think of Yellowstone. Well, uh, moving along, um, in 1873, there was some trouble brewing with the American Indians in the Northern Plains that culminated in the uh, Battle of the Little Bighorn shortly thereafter. And Hayden was, the survey was funded, but with the proviso that they kind of find safer ground. They moved south into Colorado territory at this point, 1873. Colorado is three years from statehood. Uh, the population of the territory was over 300,000 uh, European Americans. Uh, 
and uh, they'd already made two unsuccessful bids for statehood. So this was a substantially populated and comparatively highly developed territory uh, where the Hayden survey was uh, really directed to focus very heavily on mapping and uh, mapping the geology of the region as a way of uh, kind of prov providing information to the public, but also controlling and directing extractive industries in the region. That year, Jackson had finally kind of earned his stripes, and uh, Hayden gave him free reign to travel more or less at will. He suggested a few potential subjects, such as the Mountain of the Holy Cross, and uh, would say, okay, just go out there for eight weeks, and we'll meet you at Rubidoux Crossing on July 30th or something like that. So Jackson and a small party would travel and photograph more or less at will. And um, you know, if Jackson's reputation as a photographer and an adventurer hadn't already been cemented by his activity in Yellowstone in the early 1870s, this photograph of the Mountain of the Holy Cross did the job in 1873. Uh, the photograph proved a, uh, a legendary geologic feature actually did exist. This is a mountain that's usually, it's most visible from a distance of, say, 50 to 80 miles. But when you get up close, it's very hard to find. Uh, Jackson went up, found the photograph, found the, found the mountain, found exactly the right prospect, photographed it. And about a week later, his uh, mule blew the pack and dumped all the glass negatives down a hillside. So he goes dragging into camp, and he goes, well, Professor Hayden, I got something I got to tell you. Um, explained what had happened, and Hayden said, oh, that's okay. Get some lunch and go back. So uh, he went back about 130 miles through the West Elk and Elk Mountains in uh, central Colorado to photograph this a second time. Um, at this point, he takes some artistic license with the imagery. Over here on the skyline, there's a snowfield up there, and Jackson scratched through the emulsion on his plate to form that dark line so you can distinguish the skyline from the sky behind it. Uh, there's a little tiny bit of retouching in the cross, uh, just to make it a little more crossy. And uh, down here in the lower left, he's kind of scumbled uh, the emulsion in the foreground to brighten the rocks a little bit. Later versions of this photograph, uh, he's added a tumbling waterfall right down in here and actually even printed it backwards. So if it didn't look right like this, sitting on the mantle in your parlor, you could get the mirror image version of the whole thing. And at this point, Jackson's uh, uh, reputation and career really kind of take off, in part because this seems this was taken to be kind of a seal of approval, the whole uh, concept of manifest destiny uh, inspired Henry Wadsworth Longfellow to write poems about the Holy Cross and so on and so forth. The following year, Jackson uh, went into southwestern Colorado, where uh, he accompanied some locals into the Mancos Valley and made photographs of uh, ancient uh, Puebloan ruins that are now part of uh, Mesa Verde National Park down there. And that further uh, burnished his reputation in the uh, eyes of the public back east. Uh, and after this season, uh, he was kind of detailed to create a uh, diorama of the uh, Cliff Palace ruins at Mesa Verde and spent two years preparing that for the Centennial Exposition in uh, Philadelphia in 1876. And his time with the uh, Hayden survey was more or less up. In 1878, all these survey expeditions were consolidated into one entity, the United States Geological Survey, with Major John Wesley Powell in charge. But that freed Jackson and Hayden up to make one last trip um, up to Yellowstone. And uh, Jackson came back, made some photographs, and then returned to Yellowstone several times in the 1880s, the 1890s, early 1900s, and as late as 1935 when the stamps were produced. How am I doing?
All right, I'm gonna wrap it up. Um, just very briefly, I wanted to, okay, we'll talk about reproductions. Uh, you know, early on photographs were reproduced as wood engravings in the popular media. Um, they're often kind of hokey. Uh, the engravers took all kinds of licenses with the images. And you even see in something like this, you know, they've added the boat. Uh, but the, actually the image on the right is based on a Moran illustration. Uh, but you see the difference between in the Jackson photograph and the wood engraved illustration. Um, this is a photograph of an original albumin print. Uh, from the Hayden Survey reports. This is the Albertype reproduction. And I just wanted to say there's a terrific exhib exhibition upstairs, upstairs, elsewhere in the building, it's upstairs, of um, uh, copies of these Albertype prints. Albertypes were, it was a colotype process. I won't go into all the technical stuff, but it was by far the finest means of uh, uh, photographic reproduction in the late 19th century. Until the advent of photogravure, there was nothing like it. And the photographs, the prints are really rich and nuanced and beautiful. Um, and you have to spend some time up there looking at them as soon as I'm finished talking, because we have a break, right? Um, but this, uh, this, collaboration with Albert Bierstadt, um, or not Albert Bierstadt, Edward Bierstadt, Albert's brother, um, was a real milestone in Jackson's career. Unfortunately, in 1875, Edward Bierstadt's uh, studio and workshop burned down. All of the original colotype plates for this edition were destroyed as were many of Jackson's original negatives and a whole lot of prints. So these things are very rare, and when you have the opportunity to see them, you should. But this launched a whole other aspect of Jackson's career where by the 1890s he had become the chief photographer and director of something called the Detroit Photographic Company based in Michigan, which used a patented Swiss chromolithographic process to produce images like this one. And shortly afterwards, by 1906, the Foss Tint postcard, which is still considered to be kind of one of the pinnacles of postcard technology uh, from the last 100, 100 and what, 116 years, I guess. Um, and by 1906, Jackson's company was producing and selling over six million photographs per year as reproductions like this. So this kind of puts jo Jackson in the forefront of photographic publishing. He uh, engages at least 85 other photographers who produce photographs that he publishes under his name or the name of his company, making life very interesting for those of us who are concerned with attribution. And then finally, you know, you think six million postcards is a big deal. Imagine all these stamps. There were about 12 million of these stamps that were issued in 1935. Uh, Jackson publishes his uh, autobiography a few years later. And at age 99 in 1942, he fell down the stairs at his hotel in New York, broke his hip and got pneumonia and uh, became a figure of history. But we have one last picture of this wonderful portrait of Jackson. So 1935, this is at age 92. Uh, he came back to Colorado and went up to rephotograph the uh, Mountain of the Holy Cross uh, with a little 35 millimeter camera and was overheard to say, if I'd had one of these in my day, I would have made many more pictures. But there you have it. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you.